Hello, everybody. I'm Mary Ellen Slater, and I am the CEO of RepCap. And I am here to introduce everybody, invite you all to come to this webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about planning and analytics in the Microsoft ecosystem. And I think this is going to be a really fascinating discussion because it's not just about the technology, it's also about the people, it's about the processes, is it about the way that we can prepare our organizations for the future to make good decisions in a very dynamic environment. And that starts with good data and it starts with good data in the right places so that can be accessed by the right people at the right time. And I'm excited to bring together this panel because they bring together you know, different perspectives on, on how to best do this. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about in here. So first, Mike, Zach, I'm gonna let you come in and introduce yourself really quickly. You're the Chief Operating Officer of Actaris. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what does Actaris do? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mary Ellen. So hi, everyone. My name is Mike Zach. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Actaris. A little bit of background on myself. I actually started my career at a company called G Treasury. It was a, it's a FinTech organization that sells treasury technology to finance uh, departments. I was there for about uh, 13 years, then I moved over to a company called Hazeltree, which is a treasury management solution that focuses primarily on private equity and hedge funds. And then about uh, three years ago, I came to Actaris. And Actaris is a very unique type of product. We help around data governance, bringing data into a single source of truth, uh, so that way the organization can really understand where their data is, as well as allow for planning and what we call right back technology built around the Microsoft ecosystem, specifically Power BI and Excel. So just really excited to have, have the panel that we have today, as well as discuss this uh, topic that we've been discussing for many, many years and still seems to be a problem. So looking forward to providing additional solutions. All right, and we've also got Jamie Smythe, who's the CEO of the Smythe Group. Jamie, what, what are you working on these days? Hi, Mary Ellen. Uh, as you said, I'm the CEO of the Smythe Group. Our company is a custom software development agency, um, which is staffed 100% by Americans. Uh, but I live here in San Diego. Uh, as you know, I grew up in Louisiana and I started our company um, down in 2005 in Louisiana, and it was born in the uh, the mud of Hurricane Katrina and Rita. Um, I was doing a bunch of volunteering programming for the disaster relief volunteer effort. And I kept meeting other developers uh, that were also volunteering, but they were going broke. So I started hiring these other engineers and designers. Uh, and that's, that, yeah, that's how I started this Smythe Group. And we kind of still have that same DNA of uh, volunteering, being intentional, uh, slowing things down and uh, making custom software that actually solves problems. Uh, so we do a lot of mobile apps, web systems. Uh, God help me, we actually make custom AI tools now, uh, <laughs> but uh, we we have fun. Very cool. All right. And then last but not least, I've got Dave Baxter, who is the vice president of sales. And, and I believe SLED stands for something involving the government um, over at SparkHound. But that's a bit of a deceptive title. I wouldn't say even I wouldn't even know that I would call Dave like, strictly a sales guy. Like I consider him a, a technology strategist in a lot of ways and also uses these tools to figure out how to solve problems. And Dave, what kind of problems are you and SparkHound solving? Right now. Yeah, thanks, Mary Marion. As you mentioned, I'm Dave Baxter. I'm uh, the VP of Sales for our state and local government division here at Spark County. I've been with the company a little over 17 years, but I've been involved in either a working for a government entity for the first seven years of my career, working for the District Attorneys Association in Louisiana for seven years, and then coming to Spark County back in 2007. So I've spent my career trying to find uh, modernizing solutions for our government clients, because as many as many of you know, there's a lot of antiquated systems out there. There's a lot of data silos in the government that really are in dire need of modernization and creating some efficiencies to provide better services out to the citizens of these states and municipalities. So we're looking at different ways to do this. We've come up with a number of solutions recently, some of them using the generative AI tools that have become much, much more ubiquitous in the ecosystem in Microsoft to solve some really significant problems in some of our government customers. And I'll be happy to talk about those when the time is right. And I would say the thing about all three of you is that I would say you all think about it from that lens of like your customer's customer first. I would just say that's something I would say from my perspective, all three of you have in common and you think about how to solve those problems all the way to the end of the line. And I think that's very cool. And I think that's important for the way we have this conversation about analytics, because I think sometimes that gets lost. The first thing we're going to talk about is spreadsheets. Okay. 
we are, they have this love hate relationship with spreadsheets. Um, America's businesses in particular run on, you know, like America might run on Duncan, but our businesses are operating on spreadsheets still. And this is a technology that we've had, you know, for decades and it, you know, everything's in Excel, big decisions being passed around. Um, and I'm curious how many of you are currently doing your planning and operations in spreadsheets. Got a quick poll here, Grace. Let's, uh, Grace is our producer, and I'm quite curious to see how many of you are doing this. I'll give you just a couple of minutes. Um, Everybody be honest now. Be honest, like, and I mean, you can use a spreadsheet for something quick and dirty, but I mean that spreadsheet that's like, how are we going to decide our workforce planning? It lives in a spreadsheet that belongs to HR. What do our sales projections look like? That's in a spreadsheet that belongs to revenue. What is my marketing budget this year? Oh, that's in a separate spreadsheet that's over with the CMO. Come on, you know, you got these spreadsheets. Oh, 86% yes. So you're not alone. 58% of mid size and large companies all say they're still using spreadsheet to do man planning and budgeting. I'm gonna throw this out here to this group and I'm gonna actually start with my guy with my treasury background. Mike, why is this a problem? <laughs> Where do I start? I feel like I could take the whole the whole hour talking about this. Um, spreads, first off, I'll, I'll start on a positive note. Spreadsheets are great for certain purposes. And it's very easy for people to get sucked into spreadsheets because you can just click it on your desktop, open it up and start entering in data and building exactly what you have in your imagination. The problem with spreadsheets is that it stays within that spreadsheet. It's not communicated to really anyone within the organization. So you're almost like you're creating an additional siloed platform by creating yet another spreadsheet. And this multiplies as you create more spreadsheets across the organization. You don't have data governance, which is a huge component of things. It's not collected, it's not structured, which leads us to a point that we'll get into probably later around AI. Everyone, you know, there's a lot of people that come to us on a day-to-day -day basis and they say, well, we want AI. And then we turn the question back to them and we say, well, where's your data? And they say, spreadsheets. You, you, can't get, you can't make that leap. That's a very big leap because it's not structured. So a lot of challenges with it and more importantly, human error. There are plenty of stories out there of organizations that make mistakes, simple mistakes, within an Excel model that have lots of macro calculations uh, built into that spreadsheet, and it can cost an organization millions and millions of dollars. So spreadsheets are great, like you said, Mary Ellen, like the down and dirty if you're trying to get something done quickly and real quick calculations, but it's really the data governance, the, the, the silo element of, of the data and just the communication and collaboration of team members, sharing spreadsheets back and forth and different versions and just not having that control. Mm -hmm. Jamie, I hear that you're a spreadsheet super fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, love. What's yeah, wrong love. with all these spreadsheets? What's wrong with the spreadsheets from your perspective? Well, American might run on Duncan, um, <laughs> but just kind of like Excel, uh, it will do in a pinch, right? So if you're out and about and you just, need like a, a random cup of coffee then sure yeah go go through dunkin donuts and try their coffee it's a very different thing in my mind to make a commitment a business-wide commitment to provide dunkin donuts coffee to all of your employees and that is the coffee that we run on that is a very different thing and so i believe that that's the way a lot of companies operate uh, they went by through Dunkin' Donuts one day and they saw that they had some coffee and that's all they do for the future. And they just stuck there with spreadsheets because uh, making software is very progressive. Software has the word soft, which means that things change all the time. And so some business owner or some manager just latched on or created a spreadsheet one day and then you fast forward 10 years and you'll have entire departments that are running on this Dunkin Donut version of a spreadsheet. And I think, and there, as, as Mike said, there are so many problems uh, if like running spreadsheets like that, we could talk mm -hmm. all day about all the problems. Mm -hmm. Dave, what, what happens when people run in spreadsheets like because you're often brought in i know spark is often brought in to fix that i know so is and so is jamie but like when when you're thinking even from the government perspective why why is this not good 
Well, a lot of these government agencies have to do reporting up to the federal agencies that they receive funding from. And oftentimes they have various systems that contain pieces and parts of the data that they want. So they'll go pull one from this system, they'll pull one from this system, and they'll merge it all into Excel. And the problem that you run into is you don't know if you're doing that data transformation correctly. Uh, you don't know if the data source and the data quality you're getting it from is accurate. You don't necessarily have one source of truth to go from. And so it causes some confusion in there and it causes, again, this whole data silo that you get into. So when you try to harmonize those systems together and use something like a Power BI to, to meld that information together to give them more flexibility, the first thing everyone says is, can I export this to Excel? So it's almost like us as developers and software people need to eliminate that button off of every application we build and say, no, you don't need to put this into Excel. Anything you're doing in Excel, you can do in this dashboard right here. Let us show you how to use the dashboard because then you do things like, like Mike's solution does where, hey, you actually now have the ability to write back into those systems, which you don't do in an Excel spreadsheet. But if you wanna update some information based on what you're looking at doing your analysis, you now have the ability to do some write backs in that system. So it just causes some, you know, the government sector, it causes a lot of confusion. It causes errors to happen. And when you misreport information to a federal government agency that's providing you funding, that can lead to some very tough consequences. You know, when you have 90-10 funding in the Medicaid environment, for example, or 50-50 funding in child welfare, if you don't get that funding from the federal government because you're not reporting correctly, it can lead to a lot of struggle. Mm, very true. Um, I think. So let's talk about it. you mentioned like they want that button, right? And so I'm going to start with you, Dave. You're like, why do they get stuck? Like, what happens here? Why don't they want to leave? Like, what is sort of the trap? They try to get out, but they why are they still using this? We I think we've had tech better technology than this now for decades. Why can't they leave Excel? Familiarity. You know, they're comfortable with it. You know, it's just like, hey, I've been eating the same pizza from the same pizza joint for the last 20 years. I know there's a new one down the street. I don't want to try because I like this pizza. It's it's good. You know, it's good enough for me. And they've learned to do their little tips and tricks. And, you know, change is hard. We all know change, no matter what you, you, that you're moving to, change is very hard. And so the challenges that we try to overcome is, okay, we know you've been doing this this way for this long. Our challenge to you is, do you want to do it easier? Do you want to do it faster? Do you want to do it more accurately? Would you like to not have to manually do this process anymore? Um, and so we try and get the buy-in from them to say, tell us in the ideal world, what would this look like? I met with a client yesterday and she is incredibly bright. She helps her clients evaluate applications they do for tax credits. And the application process is extremely manual, but she has got this algorithm she's built in her head and she's put it into a spreadsheet, of course, where she can then calculate, here's the score I think you're going to get based on your application. It's not enough to get this and here's where your deficiencies are. But it takes her hours and hours and hours to evaluate that application. Whereas if we could put this into a model, into a generative AI model that learns the criteria, she could simply type in a few pieces of information and there's her result. So that for her, so she's motivated I to want do to get out of the spreadsheets, you know? because it's, it takes me too much time. There are tools out there now that are so much more powerful than a spreadsheet that can just simply answer my questions like that. Mm -hmm. Jamie, how do you get them comfortable with this? I mean, I think they come to you because I think they often know they have a problem, but then they still kind of get stuck. Like, how do you get them, how do you help them get over that leap and let go of that that little blankie of that Excel sheet? Do you have like, questions you ask them or a process like how do you how do you coach them through it well uh first you have to understand why why are they using this spreadsheet um and you have to understand is it one spreadsheet so we have one of our customers uh, a big roofing company um they have this this golden trophy spreadsheet it's literally one spreadsheet that runs uh all of their estimation for you know all of their work um Sometimes, though, you'll have other customers where they have daisy chains of like hundreds of spreadsheets. And so you have to understand what are you looking at first? And then you then you need to understand, um, do they need help? Just like an addict, do they want help? If they don't want help, then it's really hard. Uh, but if they understand that they have a problem, they need to understand what's the problem that they have. Do they have a problem because they want to scale, right? Using a series of spreadsheets is very 
uh, labor intensive. So it's going to slow everything down. Do they have the problem where they're having a uh, duplication, AKA data, e data errors? You have to solve that problem. If they're having siloed problems, you have to solve that. So this, to answer your question, Mary Ellen, it's uh, fix it one spray, one spreadsheet at a time. Just fix one of them and then back work upward, adapt backward, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Can't go for the magic wand, I guess. And Mike, yeah. what about you? Like, how do you typically get them through this? Like, how do you help them? Yeah, I, I agree with Jamie. I mean, the, the big bang approach, I feel, is dead. Like, it just never works. When you say I have 50 spreadsheets and I want them all converted in 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 three months, it it just never happens because then you lose you lose people in the in the mix of things, and it's a slow type of change. We're all humans. Humans hate change in the first place, so it's a kind of a slow, methodical process that you have to go through. We've actually taken a little bit of a different approach because well, we've listened to our customers and the main reason why a lot of them like Excel, among other things, is the familiarity to Dave's point earlier and th just the user interface. Well, you can replicate an Excel user interface, but just have the data model or data structure behind the scenes. So you give kind of the best of both worlds to the end user where they can go in and they can still write their own type of calculations, their own functions, but it's connected to a structure. And that's what Excel doesn't provide you. When you're in an Excel template, you have no structure. You can do anything that your imagination comes up with, but then that's not connected to anyone else's imagination. My imagination is different from Jamie's and David's and yours, Mary Ellen, and we can't get on the same page ever because we think differently. And Excel provides you that level of flexibility. So what we kind of tackle it as, we can still continue to use the Excel experience that you're used to and all the different knowledge you've learned over the years. Because fighting the trend, we just feel is, is, is an uphill battle. Everyone's trying to replace Excel and has been for the last 20 years. And it's important to, to do that. But what we've kind of tackled is give them the Excel experience with our visuals and our, our um, capabilities through our technology, but build the structure behind the scenes so everyone is connected in the same way and they're all working off of that single source of truth and have that data governance. As y'all were describing this, you just gave me like this kind of callback to a memory, something I hadn't thought of in a long time. When I first graduated from LSU and I moved to DC, I got a job, like a temp job, and my sole job at this government contractor was going through and they had made a spreadsheet of all of the funding that the federal government had given law enforcement agencies over the last like three years. And it had all been entered free form in all kinds of formats. Like some of them were docs, some of them were spreadsheets, some of them were like all of these things. And we had to pull them all into this database. It was totally like a little, I can't remember if it was access at the time, if access had, you know, whatever, something to access like, right? And it was my job to go in there and as a human being type these in and standardize them how long do y'all think that temp job lasted before i finished and i'm a really fast talker. three and a half months it's three months man it took three months eight hours a day that was my well, job at that point you were actually not a human being you were being treated like a robot <laughs> I was very angry about duplication of spending with my tax dollars and I was only like 22. It was a weird, like you, you shouldn't get that jaded when you're 22. <laughs> like, yeah, it was three full months, three months. It was messy. I wish AI had been invented then because I feel like you would just dump all of that into they would like, fix this, please. Like that's what I would have done there. Yeah. Well, um, why should you make, a, mm -hmm. make a good point, right? I mean, the, the data is the new, gold right that's what everyone wants everyone's using this to make decisions and every day we have more and more data well excel still has limitations on how much data it actually can can consume in the first place so it's it, at some point you're going to hit a limitation you're not going to be able to do anything so why not build that infrastructure up front knowing that you can scale the organization because that's what we all want we want to build businesses and we want to do right by our customers and it's just that that's the that's the key to, to understanding this is build it in a more scalable type of model and i have another thing i want to share here jamie your team did some research on this like so even let's say all that time and you're spending it spread all over the place um it's got it's got errors like all of these spreadsheets here so like Tell us a little bit about more what you learned when you did this survey. Like, 
this, what was wrong with this data? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there are tons and tons of different, you know, problems with using spreadsheets. Errors, formula errors are just one problem, right? So mm -hmm. even if you're at, if you even if you're a CPA uh, trained, you know, born in Excel land, uh, you're still it's very, very easy to make a mistake. And when you make a mistake, it's really easy for that mistake to ripple and cascade across massive data sets because, you know, as things go, business don't actually just run on one simple spreadsheet. They start mm -hmm. building a foundation and building a, an entire house on top of this spreadsheet foundation. And I'll give you one example because errors are just one problem. It's also of what happens to your people, to your own employees. I'll give you an example. So um, one of our customers, um, they are in the carpet cleaning business. And they have hundreds of employees across the country uh, that go and they need to um, service these different uh, uh, kiosks where you get, um, um, you know, rug cleaning supplies. And we sent a few of our designers across the country to watch a couple of their field reps. And they were using these little window CE device with little spreadsheets and little styluses and uh, we figured out how much long, how long does it take for them to service one kiosk? It's about 30 minutes each. But we also realized that every last one of them, they have carpal tunnel. All of them have these little cuff. And look at what that company is doing to their own employees. They're literally damaging their own health by running and operating their business in kind of like the worst way that you can do with spreadsheets on a tiny, tiny little device. So we just looked at it, observed, did a lot of interviews, R&D. We redesigned the whole thing for them into an iPhone app, uh, no carpal tunnel. We cut it down by 15% by 50, 15 minutes by 50% and saving that company about a million dollars per year just by removing one little spreadsheet thing that all of their employees so it's not just uh saving money it also saves their employees health that is wild let's let's talk about this this brings us actually to the next piece of like what our goal with these with these programs to get the right information to the right person at the right time and like that that app what you just described there it that does do that that gives them what they need in the field and it does it in a way that was faster it was kinder to their wrist you know there was a lot about that i'm i'm curious if there are any and it also just got better data i'm going to kind of take from there and i'm going to go back to you dave like what are some of the things that y'all are working on and that y'all recently worked on that really help break down some of those silos and help people make better decisions and, and share information by yeah, breaking them out of like that model yeah, this this is a project that we did a few years ago uh, for the state of Louisiana, where the, there's a combination. And, and Mary Ellen, you're you're familiar with the Department of Education here, and then we've got LASFA, the Louisiana Office of Student Financial Assistance. Well, these students that want to apply for you know for TOPS in Louisiana, it's a it's a program where you can get some of your tuition paid for by the state. Well, the Department of Education collects all the data from the school districts on the students' transcripts. And that transcript information has to go to LASFA in order for them to do a determination as to how much they're eligible for for their TOPS grant. Well, the problem that they were having is LDOE was taking the information. They'd collect it for a couple of weeks. They'd send it over to them once every maybe two weeks. And meanwhile, it's the end of the school year or the students trying to apply for, for college. And they're having to wait week to see if they're going to be eligible for a TOPS grant to get some of their tuition paid for by the state. Mm -hmm. So we came in and said, there's an easier way to do this. These two systems can talk to one another. So it didn't take a long time for us to build that connectivity between the student information system at the Department of Education with LOSFA's decisioning system for the TOPS grants. And now when that information gets into the system that the you know a, a transcript may be updated from a school in Bossier, Louisiana, that information is immediately then available to LASFA through this transcription service we built for them that just, you know, it updates, it refreshes the data. You know, it doesn't do it in real time. We do it, I think we do it every 10 to 15 minutes. We just do a refresh into their system. So now the student can really find out in a matter of 15 minutes what their eligibility is for LASFA and grants that they have now for their tuition. Uh, whereas it used to take two weeks, three weeks, four weeks for them to find out. And sometimes it was too late. So this was a great way to break down those data silos between 
two entities that don't necessarily compete with one another. They should be working more closely with one another, but they just didn't know how to do it. And so we were in that, we went in there and did that analysis and said, there's an easy fix for this problem. So what's on the back end of this? So tell me, tell me what is running that? Like what, what platforms, like what was, what was underpinning this? Yeah. And in, uh, in one side, you have a DB2 database. It's still on the mainframe. So, you know, despite the fact that we still have, a Marilyn, you know this, you live in Louisiana as well. We still have a lot of our very primary systems in Louisiana that live on a mainframe. We have, uh, we, we have a lot of modernization projects that are in the billions of dollars that, uh, that, that need to be undertaken in our state. So one side was a, was a DB2 database on the LDOE side. The other side was a SQL database. So we, have, we were able to then write that transcript and that transformation, do the ETL out of the DB2 system into the SQL database with really, again, it wasn't a lot of effort to build this. It took us a couple of weeks to build the scripts to just do the data transformation and get it into their system. And it just saved them, you know, hundreds of hours of time. And, and it saved these students from having to wait weeks and weeks and sometimes losing out on their TOPS eligibility because they couldn't get the information on their own transcript. Mm. I think that might be coming back to the fears with some of these transformation projects. I think that sometimes it is that the fact that these legacy systems, I think that's one of my, my suspicion is that's probably one of that. They just think it's going to be too much. They think because we've got this legacy database like it's going to be hard to do that but it sounds like y'all are doing it and doing it with barely accessible products like right it's pretty it's, cool. you know the tools are smart now they can they can work with some of those legacy systems the problem with the legacy system is the is the data quality you know we've seen mm -hmm. this in many instances where you'll have a system that was developed 40 years ago for example and this this field 25 years ago maybe used to be their home address and then they changed it now it's like the sweet number and so you have data quality issues or they it was a free form field where they had a phone number and someone used the parentheses and the spaces and the hyphens and someone just typed in you know 10 10 numbers and someone so the formatting of the data is off the data quality has got issues so those are things those are the big challenges you have to overcome when you're dealing with a lot of these legacy systems is just the data quality issues that you run into mm -hmm. but the accessibility to that data is so much more uh, it's so much easier now than it was 10, 12 years ago. Mike, I'm going to take this one to you next. Um, what is the, one of the examples of where one of the projects that y'all have done, like so the people have used using Actaris to to shift toward this model? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, one of my favorite examples, um, but I'll, I'll first start the conversation by mentioning that, in my opinion, Excel is a more reactive tool, not a proactive tool. And I think we sit in a, in a world where things are coming at us a million miles an hour and there's an issue that happens and we want to get the answer quickly. So we're reactive. So we view something that we're comfortable with and that's why we always revert back to Excel in the first place. And that leads me to this, this reactive versus proactive type of approach that we worked on with a customer. It was a large energy customer and they had about 500 field technicians that were going out to residential homes. And they were collecting a lot of information through those home site visits, but that information was never making its way back internally. So what we ended up doing for them was we built a, just a very simple Power BI report for all their field technicians that they can, they can access on their tablet or iPhone, has all the metrics and, and KPIs that are important to them for that home, that home visit. And one important element was we in, inserted our visual into that, that Power BI report so they can start to key in all the notes and, and that were happening. And that was, well, upon saving that, that was instantly updating the systems that their management team was monitoring through the, the different field managers. Now, what they found out later down the road, which is going back to my reactive versus proactive, is there was a field technician that was at a home and there was a gas leak. And they found out that there was a malfunctioning part within the, their gas tank. And they reported this directly within that Power BI infrastructure back to their management team. Now, this is where data is, is powerful. Not only did, I, did the information get quickly to someone so they can see exactly what was going on? They were able to take that part and cross-reference it to all the homes that these gas tanks are in to make sure that there, there was, if they had that part, then it existed. And if it did, they were able to bulk order that part, not individually order a part for one customer, bulk order that part, saving the customer a lot or saving the company a lot of money and being able to redistribute those parts out and increase that customer satisfaction. Now imagine a world where this didn't happen. You have someone that's in the field 
and they they had the gas leak they called someone internally now you're in a reactive mode now you have to solve this problem right away you're not going to bulk order that part you're going to pay more money for one part and then distribute to that one and then the next person is going to have a problem and the next person it's just cascading so i feel like that's more of a reactive approach and if you can build that more proactive ability within the organization by standardizing data and getting people into a structure it just makes things a lot easier i love this I love this. Um, and I kind of I kind of feel like we could talk about just that section. That's its own webinar. Um, I want to move on and talk to like the next piece of this, because this was something that made me think of whenever, Dave, you were mentioning like what they already had versus like sometimes we grab things again. Obviously, we were talking about the Microsoft ecosystem in this conversation. You know, Jamie, you build custom and you use Microsoft sometimes and sometimes not. And what I, what I want to talk about, I'm going to start with you, Jamie, because I think you get this conversation as an inbound and you have to help them decide. How do you know when something just off the shelf is good enough, right? And when you have to build something custom, like when you're talking to a customer, like how do you help them make that decision? I'll start with Jamie. So, yeah, it's 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 kind of a big question. So, um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the right amount of software is no software. Um, mm -hmm can't make that work, then the right answer is less software. Um, less is better. Um, and we have seen so many companies that are being overwhelmed with bloated software, with features coming out of their ears, their employees don't know how to use, they don't even know that they exist. Um, and so, as I said, I believe that uh, start stopping for a second, because I, I am getting to your point, stopping mm -hmm. and figuring out what is the kind of decision that you're trying to make. Um, and I've seen a lot of companies, they latch on to this either off the shelf software system, hoping that somewhere in these thousands of features that this system, thinking about SAP or something, they're hoping that somewhere in all these thousands of features, there's gonna be a feature that will help them solve and fix and, and answer the decision that they haven't taken the time to figure out what is the decision they need to make every week. So that's where I would start. Uh, when we meet with you know, the C-suite, we dig, like what are the kind of questions that you're trying to get? Let's start there and then work backward to figure out if there's an off the shelf system that can help or if there's something that's off the shelf that needs to be configured or integrated into your existing systems or another component. Or do you just need to go full custom? But mm -hmm. starting with what is the root cause? What is the thing that you need to fix? The feature bloat is real. I we did an audit. I have a very I have a small agency, less than 20 employees, and we did an audit of all of our tech, like every platform, because in the SMB world, you can just just impulse buy it. And even frankly, even in the mid market, there's more and more software that you can just buy, right? Or you've already got it. And in the course of this, I learned that we have 11 tools that do AI transcripts <laughs> of content, and only two of them are explicitly sold to us as things that make this is your transcript tool. Everybody, like the features, I just feel like there's this overlap, this crazy, like, what does this tool do? And just, I think it just gives you a lot of anxiety. You don't know if you need something else. Like, it's just, it's kind of out of control. <laughs> um, Dave, what's your process look like? I mean, you're also just like Jamie, you're doing those discovery calls. You're taking those conversations. Like, how are you figuring out, okay, are we gonna build something? Can you do this with what you have? Can we do something? with the Microsoft current Microsoft ecosystem? Is this something you've got to go fully custom with? What's that conversation like? Yeah, it's it's actually a very good time because right now I'm working with two different clients and uh, one, you know, and I'm sure Jamie and, and Mike have run into this as well. Everybody thinks their business is so unique that there's no off the shelf software that can do what they need to do. And so I'm working with a client now and they are convinced we need to write a custom system. All of our competitors have custom systems. No one has anything off the shelf. And I was like, okay, great. But let me just look and see what's out there. Now, look, I would love to build them a custom system. I mean, that's what we do. I'd love to write them a system and charge them a whole bunch of money. But I know that there's a solution out there for this company. And it took me about 
I don't know, 30 minutes of doing some Google searches on their business model. And I found a couple of solutions that were out there. So of course, my, I'm going to say, look, let's look at these solutions out here. If they can fulfill at least 80 to 85% of what you need, this is where you need to go. You're going to lack some customization maybe, but a lot of them have configuration. And understanding the difference between customization and configuration is one of our jobs to, to inform them on what that means. Uh, but if it can do that, unless you are hard pressed that you want to own your software and maybe someday you market it out to your competitors and you sell your software and you become a software provider, there's a lot of time. So I'd say 80% of the time I deal with somebody, there is a commercially available system that's out there that can solve a lot of their needs. When there's not, like the one I met with yesterday, she has developed this fantastic algorithm in her head. It's a very unique business model. There's nothing out there that, and she's been looking for years if there's something out there to do that. So now we- and When we you looked that up for her, you couldn't find it? Like you couldn't oh, find like anything no, like what she was doing? No, it's a very, so very specific. unique business model. You know? And so she's developed this whole algorithm and she's developed a spreadsheet to run her algorithm to do the analysis for her clients that now we're like, there's a better way to do this. So this is an opportunity for us to develop a custom piece of software that uses Gen AI to do the analysis mm -hmm. of her of what she's got in her brain right now in order to do that uh, analysis for her clients and speed up her process from taking weeks and weeks and weeks to do the analysis to literally taking minutes to do the analysis. So that's an area where, you know, she wants to take this thing build it, we can do what we call an MVP and you know, a minimum viable product. She's got three stages of her process. Let's just do stage one and let's test it. Don't what did you build that on? What, what is it on? Like, what, what do you think the back end of that'll be? Like, what is this? My, is it real big? Because y'all are a Microsoft shop. Like, what's it on? We are. What are you going to build it are. on? Uh, you know, I haven't sat down with my engineers yet. We are, you know, we're big in the power platform space right now. We've had a lot of opportunities to build in power platform and using Power BI on the on the dashboarding side, you know, whether it goes into something like a dataverse on the back end or a SQL environment, just depends on what the data structure needs to look like. And that she wants to make this publicly accessible and have people have, her clients have subscriptions to the software. So, you know, it's gonna be a web-based tool, but that that's a case where there's just nothing like her business model that I've seen anywhere. And she's been looking for a while. And so this is a case where she wants to become a software provider. She wants to become a SaaS provider and then sell that SaaS company at some point. So that's the case where you can't do that if you're buying something commercially off the shelf because it's someone else's IP. She wants to own the IP and then eventually sell it. So for, for her, it makes more sense to build versus buy. Mike, how's that conversation typically go for you? Because like Terrace connects custom stuff to like store to the store-bought stuff too. So like, how do you help, how, typically help people think through that? Yeah, and I like David's comment, customization versus configuration, which is vastly different from each other. Um, and, and I believe just we're all consumers and we in the consumer world always seems a lot easier. Like you download an app and it just works. <laughs> you don't have to go through a lot of hoops. Now the business world is a lot more complex uh, in, in some cases. Uh, so what we do is, and to take Jamie's point earlier, like we take a step back and we just want to understand the entire landscape of what you're trying to do. I think we've gotten into a world, it's the SaaS boom, where different departments decided to purchase different platforms and they're not even fully integrated with each other. They're using 30% of the features, but they're paying 100% of the bill. Like, these are all the problems that we have in today's world. So taking a step back and, and picking a, an out-of-the-box solution that you can configure and tailor to your business is what's important, what we try to pitch the most to, to organizations. Because time and time again, we get to a point where um, you know we're up against the competition in a certain deal and they say, well, they have something that's out of the box. And I'm like, well, then why does it take them six months to implement it? If it's out of the box, then shouldn't it be done in you know a couple of weeks? And it's to a point where you want something that's flexible that you can tailor to the business, but most of it's already out of the box and it's consistent. It's consistent with the framework. It's consistent with the foundation that your business is on because someone's gonna have to support this. The users are gonna leverage it for the day to day, but someone's gonna have to support this on the back end and integrate it, make sure that they're SOC compliance and all the security protocols are there. I mean, there's so much governance around that. And I think a lot of people miss that because they're trying to be reactive. I have a problem, I need to solve it right now, free up my time, and then they move on to the next one. And that's how we amass 150 different SaaS products on average within these corporations that don't communicate with one another. Wait, how many? How many? 150 on average. Oh, Jamie, does that track for you? 
you see 150 uh, when you look under the hood and a lot of these bigger companies well yeah yeah we're yeah we're working with one right now they have 62 different systems completely different completely custom with all different phases of of legacyness and yeah it's just crazy <laughs> oh dave when y'all do your audit 150 does that track for you like think, just thinking mid-market mid, mid I mean, big market to enterprise or big government agency does that does that track oh sure you know you talk about oh. you know back in the days when we were doing the you know the migrations from different versions of the windows desktop operating system you've got to do an analysis of the applications to make sure that they're going to run on the new environments and so when you do that analysis of their environment and you figure out how many applications they're running that they have no idea about because shadow it has taken over and to Mike's point, you know, the consumerization of IT, you know, when this when this little device came out, you know, in 2007, it changed the landscape of IT departments because now everybody could download something onto their phone. There was an app for it already, and they expect the same thing out of their IT organization. So all of a sudden now you've got everybody that thinks they're an IT person downloading these apps onto their desktops. You know, they're using them, you know, without without any, to Mike's point, without any consideration of what other systems they need to talk to without any consideration of the security of the information they're now putting in this app that they've downloaded. And so we do, we find so many applications that are out there in rogue environments that are causing a lot of headaches. And then that leads to a lot of cybersecurity issues. So the, the lack of protection in those things is, is astronomical. You got good timing there because I was thinking as y'all were both describing like that we talked about the AI thing earlier. I feel like the old like I want to build an app and then y'all have the conversation where you're like that sounds like a web page, you know, from 20 <laughs> years ago. Um is now I think it's the I want AI, how do we use AI? And then you have to well, what on what data, you know, and what are you doing? And I think the speed versus security and like sort of the changes that we have to make. And, and um, I'm just going to like pick this up with you, Dave, because like you are dealing with government entities where you are carrying, you were talking earlier about the financial aid thing. That is, that is, that is personally identifying information. Like you are holding on to things that are highly valuable, need to be protected. Obviously we want to use AI on it, but like, how do you balance empowering employees your employees right in this case government workers uh giving them access to data making it easier to share across departments with protecting that data mm -hmm. in a way that makes ai our friend and not <laughs> our enemy and i'll let yeah. you go first and then jamie i'm gonna let you take this next i'll give you like a minute to think about it because i know you have lots of thoughts about this <laughs> yeah and You're this up, may Dave. be this is one of the, Jamie said it earlier, you know, slow down, right? And this is one of the cases where it's almost a good thing the government moves at the speed of government. They don't ever jump on the chain of anything really fast and go full speed ahead with it. There's so many policy decisions that need to be made. There's so many security decisions that need to be made. And so they're, they're typically a little bit behind the curve, but this is one case where it's okay to be a little bit behind the curve with AI because there's so many considerations that need to come into play around your data quality, your data structure, your data security. That they need to really get a handle on that first and they need to develop policies. There are working groups right now, and I want to say 18 states around AI policies that they're developing for all their agencies in the states to make sure that they're protecting the data of their citizens. Uh, nine times out of 10, they have no idea what information is actually shareable in their environment. Someone's given someone a link to a database somewhere. Someone's given someone a link to a spreadsheet somewhere. Well, that link is probably open. So when you start making those tools accessible to AI tools, next thing you know, you're sharing that information that you didn't even know was accessible. So we really try and slow them down and say, let's do an analysis. And there's some there's some really good tools out there. Uh, I think Wharton created one called AIRQ. It's like the AI readiness quotient. Deloitte's got a tool out there where they got to look at things like what's your strategy, what's your execution plan, you know, are you trying to innovate with this and what's your innovation plan behind that? And then how do you enable your people to use the tools effectively, but also being responsible and using them ethically? Jamie, yeah, how do we thanks. how do we balance this? 
Yeah, thanks for thanks for making that point, Dave, about doing this ethically. Um, I keep seeing um, AI readiness. Uh, I would like to change that and say like AI reason. Why mm. do you need AI? Um, is it just the you know the feature du jour? Probably, possibly. Um, just a couple of years ago, it was blockchain. Every prospect was coming to us. We need blockchain. We're just like, no. What you need is a database. But I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm. I'm an AI fan. It's great. However, if you just go back one more step and say, like, why do you need AI? And then, and then slowly go into, yes, are you ready for this? Because many companies they can't even deploy a very simple CRUD system automatically on any kind of frequency uh, you know daily but now they're going to rush to some experimental software to actually fix their problems are you sure that's what you need um however uh ai is an accelerant it's an accelerant it makes everything faster but when you go faster it's easier to make mistakes so i do understand that you need to be ready for this so starting with what is your use case what is the practical use case and and write it down in one sentence if this business can't write down one simple concise use case of why they need ai they probably have a pretty big problem um, a lot of some of our customers we have a couple hollywood customers um, and they are very very concerned about security privacy privacy is the biggie um, because most LLMs have actually been trained on copyrighted material. Just think about that for mm -hmm. a second. So all of the LLM companies that are creating these LLM, nobody's going to make their, OLM, their own LLM. That costs millions and millions of dollars to make your own LLM. So you need to use one. All of the companies that are producing LLMs, it has all been trained on copyrighted material. They, they grabbed copyrighted material and that's how they created that LLM. So some companies that are very, very concerned about copyrighted material, they won't even allow their employees to use any LLM and that's the essence of any AI tool, right? So that's a big problem. And then you get down to data quality, right? Thinking about readiness. Even if you don't have those kind of concern uh, about privacy and security, uh, data quality, are you sure that retrieving the document that you have is actually going to solve the problem that you have? Are you sure that the documents and the Excel sheets is actually going to help your employee to make a good decision? Most of the time, you need to go down to the root and look at the data that you have um, and make sure that it's structured, is it cleaned, and has it also been uh, the word is chunked to make sure that you're not just going to get the wrong document or the wrong answer from the wrong document. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of data problem. One of the examples that I have is um, an alcohol uh, uh, alcohol distributor in Connecticut that we're working with. They use uh, Power BI and they wanted us to create some AI tools on top of that. And we looked at the data. It was it was it was a dumpster fire. It was just as Dave says, <laughs> you got telephones, you know, with commas mm -hmm. and apostrophes and just none of this is going to make sense unless you fix the root. And we just keep seeing it over and over again. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Mike, what about y'all? You baked ML and AI tools into Actaris. Like how or how do you like to think about this? The readiness on this and like getting people in the right place to balance that stuff. And you're also very sensitive to finding that you are your background. Like you you think about money and you think about what am I doing here and I'm moving stuff around. How do you have that conversation? Like when it comes to bringing in Actaris as a tool? Well, the transition from where we are to AI is not it, the, the transition itself is not new, right? We we went through the same process from like on-prem to cloud. It it comes down to one word: trust. Do you literally trust this? And I look at my 78-year-old uh, father-in-law, and when we introduced ChatGPT to him, his first question was, "Where is this going?" Now look at his life. He I went like from having internet 
the, you know, mailing things in. And he, he asks those questions, but the younger generation, they come in and they say, well, I trust everything. And it's just going into nowhere. Well, and then now you start to start questioning things. Well, why is it free? Well, it's free because they're using what you're giving it. And it's, it's building that uh, first off with your customers is that they have the trust in you that you're going to do right by them and right by their data. Um, and building that infrastructure where you don't want to, you don't want to go out and say that we're just leveraging what's out there and we're just distributing your data and we have no control around it. Uh, cause people will trust you just be based on what you say. And you don't want, you want people to trust, but verify. And I think in our old lives, we, we should be doing this in the first place. So for us, it's, yeah, we use AI, but we spend a lot of time before we introduce this. And I don't even like using the word AI. I like more of the Apple model where things just work and they have the privacy is what they're concerned with. They don't use AI. Not the last round of <laughs> advancements they started using it, but Microsoft came out and they said AI everything. And that, I think that's where it comes down to is really getting the trust in the, in the individuals and making sure that where the data is going, that it's protected and that you're protecting your customers in the long run. I got a little wild card question, actually, as we have a couple of minutes here left. When we think about AI right now, and we've got, like you mentioned, how expensive it is to build an LLM, right? So we've all, we've talked about open AI and chat GPT. We've talked about, you know, Microsoft's got a model, like we've got Gemini over here with Google. How do you decide, and I'm not going to ask you this first, Dave, because I know, again, you're a Microsoft shop, but I know you could probably give a nuanced conversation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Jamie, because Jamie, I know you think about this a lot. Like, which, how do you decide who's AI? Like in the back of you're not going to go build a custom LLM. So whose are you going to use? Like, whose do you trust? Like, yeah. Uh, is it, is it a yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks for the question. So just like so many things in life, it's complicated, right? It's there. It's not just like one right. simple because mm -hmm. even if you're just trying to figure out which LLM, there are different ways that you can use LLM, right? So if you're mm -hmm. going to use ChatGPT from OpenAI, you don't get the LLM itself. You get access mm -hmm. to an API and you can use their LLM. And that's the same with Gemini. Now, there are other ones where they you can literally download the open source LLM like Meta, uh, uh, Llama mm -hmm. from Meta or Falcon, right? You can that you literally get the LLM and you can download it yourself and put it in your own instance. Right, so that's one big decision. And the way to make that decision is about money, right? So if you're going to use, for example, the ChatGPT API, and then you're going to build your software around ChatGPT's API, you're going to be paying money to OpenAI until you stop using it, right? It's, it's, it's you pay per token, per word, basically, right? So as long as you use this system with their API, you're paying them. Uh, AWS has the same thing, right? Amazon also have LLMs that is built on top of LLMs and same thing, you're gonna pay Amazon for that. Microsoft has the same thing. You can use their API that has their own LLM and you're gonna pay Microsoft every month. So whatever system you're gonna build, if it gets very successful, and if you're going to start giving it to your customers, just be prepared. Your bills are going to be going up and you're going to be giving money just for that, whoever is that LLM, that API. If you use an open source LLM and you make your own software and you put it in your own instance, typically your instance will also be an Amazon instance or a Microsoft instance. Mm -hmm. You're not paying for the API for the LLM requests right? You've made your own, so you don't have to pay for that, right? So money is the big thing, the, is the first thing. The second thing is what kind of uh, work are you going to be doing? If you're going to be asking questions that is uh, just documents, that's one kind of LLM. If you're going to be visual, like images, video, audio, those are different kinds of LLMs that you should use. And then probably for this audience, uh, there is actually, there are ways that you can train, train is not the right word, but we use it for normal parlance, uh, mm -hmm. for Excel files, for spreadsheets. So if you have a thousand spreadsheets and you need to ingest in your own custom AI, there are platforms and frameworks that you can use 
that will digest your spreadsheets and help you make better decisions. So as it things- can, It can take uh, all my spreadsheets and turn them into one spreadsheet. I thought I, thought I couldn't <laughs> have that. <I'm> not... <laughs> Oh, I thought I couldn't have that. Like, um, all right, Dave. I, I know, I know you're, I know you're a Microsoft guy, but like, how do you help people decide that? Like, when you're like, yeah, we can help you, and we'll do this on Microsoft versus like, well, let me give you a Jamie's number. No, no, what, what does that conversation usually look like? Well, it's interesting because a lot of times, you know, we're walking in the door with Microsoft, and they have an enterprise agreement already, so they have right. access to the tools. So the fact that they already own it is one of those decision points. It's the Jamie's earlier point. Right. It's about the money. They already. They have access to the tools already. They don't want to go out and buy another one. So they're like, look, we're just going to use this because we already have access to it. We trust it to Mike's earlier point. We trust the solution. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we don't often get into the conversation of which one's better or not, because we're to your point, we're we're typically in the Microsoft realm. We're walking in the door with them and so forth. And we are we're look, we're a user of those tools ourselves. We eat our own dog right. food. So and we're very happy with with the solutions that we're developing on top of their AI. And we developed a solution for one of our customers using the Gen AI tools. And you mentioned it earlier, uh, Mario, the transcript solution for government agencies where they, hmm. law enforcement, you know, they record all these, these um, interrogations that they do, these interviews they do with suspects, and they would have to then transcribe that interview. And it would take them hours and hours and hours to transcribe it by hand or send it off to a court reporting service to get it transcribed. Now we had a solution that we, you know, we developed a very simple solution. It didn't take a lot to put the front end on the Azure Cognitive Services tools that are out there that they already have access to. They uploaded a two hour and 36 minute interview with a, uh, with a suspect and it took 11 minutes to transcribe and, and publish that out into a Word document. And it gave them the confidence level and it broke down, this is speakers and you could put in the speaker name for speaker one, two, three, four, five. Speaker names are all in there. The confidence level of the transcription is posted right next to that word. Um, it can it it will trans it'll it'll put the words in red that it didn't necessarily read quite well enough. You know, if the, maybe the person has a different dialect, and that you know that would have taken them days and days and days to transcribe that solution. Where now it literally took minutes to transcribe that solution, and they can upload 20 audio files at a time if they want and have them all done at the same time. Just a matter of how much horsepower do you have behind the solution. So. It's a huge benefit to them to use hey, to use the tools that they already own and take advantage of them. I think we talked about it earlier. You have these tools that you don't use, but 30% of the functionality. Mm -hmm. well, dang, you're paying for 100% of the functionality, so use it if you've got it. Mm. You know what else? I'm going to say what else that creates, because it comes back to that bit about like, well, there's, all, there's plenty of off-the-shelf things that would have done that but they don't quite work because here there are privacy, elevated privacy concerns. There are elevated uh, chain of, of evidence concerns that need to be tracked. And like what I love about that as a solution isn't just the time saved is, do you know what, as somebody who is an advocate of like police, like accountability, that that's part of your, like your, if you want that, you just created a really transparent chain that not just the confidence but the confidence of the transcript you just gave me greater confidence in the whole system mm -hmm. because you just somebody typing what they thought someone said or like it was recorded like you just took that out and if someone changes that trend that document i have a record mm -hmm. exactly right i have a record of your interpretation of like where you modified it that has I think that that has benefits that go beyond just thank you for saying I'm so glad it saved three hours, right? But you also just gave us confidence in a different way. I can see that you edited this. There's mm -hmm. a chain that that affects the whole chain of evidence there. I, I actually think that's quite cool. So <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, Mike, I'm gonna give you the last word on this because we are at time. What else? Um, yeah, we look at it more. Like, what's the purpose? of what you're trying to do. And this goes back to, to Jamie's point earlier. Like, are you creating a, a new job posting? All right, well then maybe ChatGPT is fine for you because it's open source, it can give you something generic. Or is this for more of the call really center? Really biased, man, don't do it, don't do it. Like, it's the worst. I have friends who do that for a living and they're like, oh no. <laughs> it's true, yeah, it, it, yeah. And it get to a point too, like when now you're doing what we call like knowledge-based models, where it's specific, in, it's it's specific to an industry or a specific business challenge, which is going to be helpful for a lot of organizations. And then the, to come back full circle to, to protection of your own data, 
right? And just having the trust of where things are and the convenience too. We're, we're a big convenience country, the America, for the first for the most part. And when you have a button that says co-pilot in your Power BI report and you just click on it and start communicating with it, well, that's pretty convenient versus me having to go to a completely separate product or a completely separate screen. But I think people think in that way too, but it's still, again, understanding do you trust where the data is going? Is it is it is there components around it that are being that are protecting your data? And I think that's where we really need to figure out is what's the purpose? What's are do you trust the provider? And then the convenience of making sure that you are becoming productive and you're not bouncing around to different places. Awesome. Well, this is great. And we are at 1201, and that's a good close as any. I want to thank all three of you for, for joining this conversation. It even went in some areas that I didn't, I think we didn't even anticipate early on, even in our planning. Um, if you got me thinking about a bunch of different things, actually. So anybody else, if you've got questions, you know, for any of these, come and uh, follow. You can come um, connect with Jamie or Mike or Dave on LinkedIn. Um, and then we'll be sending this out on demand so you can take a listen. Um, we'll even transcribe it. You know, it'll even be... <laughs> Maybe we'll test Dave's system. Maybe we'll test Dave's system. Maybe it's better. Um, but yeah, so thanks so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.